Good morning. morning. If we haven't met, uh, my name is Scotty James. I'm the lead pastor here. It is good to be with you. Uh, This past week, I was reading a book on marriage. Me and my wife periodically will, will go through marriage books together. I think it's important if you're married. Never stop investing in your marriage. Never stop trying to not just improve, but equip yourself to be a better husband or spouse because when you put it in cruise control, so to speak, in marriage, that's when you'll start drifting the wrong way. And so we're reading this book together. And in the book, it was detailing different stories of different couples about how they got together. And what's interesting is that each couple had a different journey towards marriage. Some couples had love at first sight, where they saw the person, they knew they were the one, and that's where they, they went. Other couples, they had a different story. It was love at first sight for maybe one person, but for the other person, the other person you know, grew on them, and over the course of time, they consented and, and got married. So each, <laughs> each person had a different story in regards to how they came together. Uh, but what's interesting is that no matter who you are, all, in all of the couples, all of them had a crossroads in their marriage where they had to define their relationship. At some point, someone said, listen, I want to marry you. These are what my intentions are, and I want to commit my life to you till death do we part. The vows that they took defined their relationship. What's interesting is that it's not just romantic late relationships that have to be defined. Every relationship, if it's healthy, is defined, and there's clarity in some way, shape, or form. Consider your, your job, for example. When you get employment, you and your employer define the relationship. The employee says, these are the days that I promise to work, these are the tasks that I promise to fulfill, and these are the ways in which I'll fulfill them. And then the employer says, this is what I promise to pay you to fulfill these things, and they give you a job description of the expectations. That's how you define that relationship. Or memberships, if you have a gym membership, the Costco or, or uh, your mortgage, for example, you have a relationship with that mortgage company. You say, this is how much money I agree to pay you. This is how much money I owe you. I'll pay it with this much extra entrance. Your relationship is clearly defined. Does that make sense? The Village Church has been around for six months. We've been on this campus for six months. I believe uh, 28 Sundays, which is 196 days. And it's time for us to define our relationship. Is this a cute summer fling? (laughs) Or is this going to be something deeper? It's time for us to define our relationship. And there's three things I want to answer today. I want to look at what is church membership. I want to look at why should someone join a church. I want to look at what is the biblical precedent for church membership. And so our anchor text today will be Romans chapter 12, which we just saw, and we'll open it up again. Go ahead and go to Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 1 to 5, and if you need notes, go ahead and raise your hand if you did not get one, and we'll have a young man uh, come by and give you a note so you can follow along. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have a note. Okay, there's one back there. Let's make sure he gets that. We'll go Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 5. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each one of us has one body with many members... And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So the way the book of Romans is constructed is that the first 12 chapters of Romans are theology. Paul kind of sets the foundation for the faith. He teaches things like Jews and Gentiles are both separated from God because of their sin. What that means is that no matter what ethnicity you have, no matter what age you are, no matter how much money you have, Everyone is in the same situation, separated from God because of our sin. He also teaches that salvation, which means deliverance, deliverance from what? Deliverance from the penalty of your sin. The only way you get salvation is through faith in Christ. So observance of the law doesn't rid you of your sin. 
Doing good things doesn't cleanse you of your sin. Observing certain holidays, eating certain foods, that doesn't cleanse you from your sin. Only faith in Christ, meaning trusting what Jesus did on the cross, trusting that his death on the cross was for your sin, that's how salvation comes. That's how right standing comes with God. And so Paul lays that out for the first 12 chapters, and then after that, he lays out the implications of that. He's saying, because of what God did, this is how you should then respond. Is that making sense? And so now we get to verse 12, and he says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, again, in view of the gospel, in view of what we just learned for the past 12 chapters, this is what I want you to do. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. So before we go any further, I want to stop there and really park on that. This is your only appropriate response to the gospel. This is it. It's to offer your body as a living sacrifice. If you are a Christian, you are a living sacrifice. That is your identity. You are a living sacrifice. It's important that we realize this because sometimes this is lost in the faith. We think you're a Christian because you went to camp and prayed a prayer. We think you're a Christian because you go somewhere on Sunday, and that's not what the Bible teaches. Your identity is a living sacrifice. There's a paradox there because a sacrifice is something that's dead. When you sacrifice something, you put it on an altar in dedication, so to speak, and it's dead. It burns up on, on, the, on, on the altar. But Paul is saying that you are a living sacrifice. What that means is that you are dead to yourself. You are dead to your old way of life. You are dead to doing things your way, and you are alive to Christ. You no longer live for yourself. You no longer live to fulfill your sinful gratif gratification. You live to honor and serve Christ. You're a living sacrifice. So if you're a Christian, I want you to know that this is your new identity. You are a living sacrifice. And so the gospel... And us being a living sacrifice, God's ownership of us, it has practical implications. It has responses that stem from our identity as a living sacrifice. And Paul lists three of them in these next verses. Verse 2, he says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Again, because of the gospel, because you're a living sacrifice, do not conform to the pattern of this world. The second thing he says is, because of the gospel, do not, excuse me, be renewed by your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then the third thing, because of the gospel, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. So those are three behaviors that stem from us being living sacrifices. Are you following me so far? Okay. Now, as we move into verse four, he's going to provide an explanation as to why we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Look at verse four. He says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So he says, look, you have a, a human body. He gives an illustration. Okay. Your human body has lots of different parts that make up that one body. In the same way, if you're a Christian, you are a part of the body of Christ and each member belongs to all the others. In your notes, I want you to underline that part. Each member belongs to all the others. If you consider yourself a Christian, this statement has great implications for your life. To be a Christian is to be part of the body of Christ. To, to, to be a Christian is to belong to other Christians. You can't separate Christianity from belonging to a body of believers. Now, sometimes we do because in America we have, uh, again, a very individualistic, autonomous way of life, and so we carry that into our faith, and we tend to focus on my personal relationship with Christ. And that is true, that's absolutely a thing, but that's incomplete theology. All throughout the Bible, belonging to Christ is synonymous with belonging to his church. You can't separate the two. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll see it there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 to 17. Go ahead and write these other verses down as well. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. In Ephesians chapter 4, 
verse 25. All of these scriptures will talk about how union with Christ is synonymous with union in his church. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, it says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. So Paul here is talking about communion. If you're not familiar with what communion is, it's when believers come together, they drink grape juice, and they eat bread or some sort of wafer. All right? That communion, that Lord's Supper, that Eucharist sometimes it's called, it's not just evidence of your union with Jesus. Verse 16, he says, is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Communion is evidence of your belonging to Jesus and your belonging to the body of believers. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Again, union with Christ is synonymous with union with the church. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, and speak truthfully to your neighbor. Why? For we are all members of one body. So to be a Christian, I think it's crystal clear, to be a Christian is to be a part of the church. But this is where people start to get apprehensive or cynical or skeptical. There's a strong distrust when you talk about church membership amongst a lot of people. People are members of all types of things in society. You got gym memberships, Costco memberships, healthcare memberships, but all of a sudden when it's a church membership, we say, whoa, 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 this is, this is uncomfortable now. And why is that? And there's a couple reasons. I think one, there's a real distrust to the church, and understandably, I think there have definitely been abuses throughout the history of the church with power and authority, and so people are skeptical of that. I also think, though, that one of the reasons people are apprehensive of the th- thought of being a member of a church is because we emphasize in this culture Christianity without commitment, like commitment-less Christianity is what is typically preached. Consider how the verbiage that we use with the church. What church do you go to, or are we going to church today? So church is a place that you go to, like a restaurant, or you go to a ball game, like you go to it, but we don't say, what church do you belong to? We're not typically after making church members committed people, we're after making church attendees But nowhere in scripture do you see anything like that. The concept of church is not a place you go to, but it's a people you belong to. And so this idea of, I don't know about the church being a member, we've got to get past that because scripturally speaking, there's strong biblical precedent for belonging to a church. So what exactly do I mean by church membership? What I don't mean is locking you into an agreement so that we get X amount of your income or locking you into an agreement so that you serve here and that we get, we're not we're talk, talk, talking about taking from you. To me, what we mean by church membership, and this is the first one in your notes, church membership is covenantal community. That's what church membership is. Write that down. When I say church membership, I'm talking about covenantal community. At the core of the church, it's not an organization. Yes, there's some order, yes, there's some structure, but at the core of the church, scripturally speaking, it reflects a community of people. When you join a church, you're joining a community and you're entering into covenant with them. You're saying, I am committing to these people and these people are committing to me. I'm committing to pursuing God with these people and loving these people with the grace that God gives me. I'm submitting, I'm voluntarily submitting myself to these people, and I'm committed to them. Why? Because they're cool? No, because we belong to each other. That's what the Bible says. And they're committed to me. Why? Because we belong to each other. Covenant community means that I'm not going to run off to the next church the second the pastor says something I don't like. Why? We belong to each other. I want you to see this. Covenant community means I'm not going to run off to the next church because this week the worship lady played a song that I don't appreciate. I'm not going to run off. Why? Because we belong to each other. 
covenant community steps out of the shallow waters and into some depth. Covenant community and consumerism can't coexist. Consumerism is, I'm going to this church because they have this special youth group that I love. And then when this youth group opens up and they have a better entertainment, I'm going there. Covenant community doesn't do that because covenant community is committed to a people. Covenant community belongs to a group of people. Covenant community is there for more than just shallow things. Covenant community is what God desires his church to be. That's church membership. But yet you'll still have people who say church membership is not in the Bible. Church membership is a man-made thing. All of us belong to the universal church. The local church is just a man-made thing. I want to go through the biblical precedent for church membership. But before I do that, I want to make clear, there is nowhere in Scripture that you will find a verse that says, you must join a local church. It is not in there. I think the reason why it's not in there, though, is because church membership is assumed all throughout the Scripture. They didn't have this concept of consumeristic Christianity, or they didn't have this concept of shallow Christianity. To be a Christian was to belong to a church, so it, they didn't need to write it in there. It's just, it was just there. It was an assumed thing. But even so, uh, all throughout Scripture, belonging to a church is, is, is very much inferred. And so we're going to look at that today, the three, and there's more than three, but three specific biblical precedents for belonging to a church, being in covenant community. So let's go, go ahead and go to Hebrews chapter 13, and we'll look at verse 17. Hebrews 13. Verse 17. Okay. It says, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that will be of no benefit to you. The first biblical precedent for church membership, and this is in your notes, is submission to leaders. Write that down. The first biblical precedent for church membership is submission to leaders. Submission to leaders. What does that mean? It means that these Hebrew Christians were instructed to listen to, obey, and allow these leaders to lead them in a spiritual sense. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, uh, the, the writer says to the Hebrew Christians that they're instructed to remember their leaders. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, the writer to the Thessalonian church tells them to honor their leaders. What leaders are they talking about? How are they supposed to do this? How are you supposed to obey your leaders if there's no local church that you're a part of? What leaders are you supposed to obey? The ones down the street? The ones that you like? The ones in China? Like, what leaders are you supposed to obey? Submit to their authority. Which ones? The ones who look like me? The ones who act like me? Like, how am I supposed to live this out? And what if this pastor says one thing and this pastor says another thing? How do I, how do I practically live this out? And this, on a side note, by the way, is one of the reasons why I don't advise people bouncing around from church to church without having a home church. I want to be clear about this. This is not a, I'm not intending to be dogmatic about this. I don't want to add to the scripture. There is nowhere in the Bible that speaks against being a part of multiple churches. But let's, let's evaluate if that's really the best decision. And let's do it with some questions. What is the purpose of you belonging to a church? If it's to just simply hear a sermon, then yeah, why not be a part of multiple churches? The more sermons you get, the merrier. In fact, if it's just about hearing a sermon, why not just stay home and watch it online? Because you can watch more than one in an hour. Is your belonging to a church uh, about the worship music? If so, then why not be a part of multiple churches? Is your belonging to multiple churches for the purpose of serving? If it is, then, then, then why not belong to multiple churches? If surface level activities is the purpose of belonging to a church, then you should absolutely belong to multiple churches because it facilitates surface level activities. But if you're looking for something deeper, belonging and bouncing around from church to church is not the best idea because it actually inhibits depth. Is it sin? No. It just creates a clear limit to how deep things can go. If we want depth, if we take serious that we're a covenant 
if we take serious the idea of belonging to one another, if we take serious the idea of submitting to church leadership, then doing it at multiple places isn't feasible. There's a guaranteed level of shallowness if you're not committed to one place. It's like having multiple relationships. You can't give all of yourself to anyone. There's a shallowness that you're guaranteeing. So is it sin? No, but I don't advise people to not have a church home and just go to this church for this time and this church for some. I believe you should have a church that you're committed to, that you're living in covenant with. The first biblical precedent for church leadership is submission to leaders. The second one, let's keep moving, go to Acts chapter 20. In fact, write a couple verses down. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and then write down 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. We're going to look at both those scriptures. Acts 20 to 28. And then 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. Talking about the biblical precedent for church membership. Acts 20, 28. It says, keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, talking to pastors, to elders. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and as a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. The second biblical precedent in your notes for church membership is spiritual oversight. It's closely connected to the first one, spiritual oversight. Okay, so as a pastor, the Bible teaches that I will have to give an account to God for how I have led his people. Question, who am I responsible for? Am I responsible for every Christian walking the face of the earth right now? Am I responsible for every Christian in this country? Am I responsible for every Christian who has the same color skin as me? Am I, who am I responsible? I'm responsible for the people who are in my church. This, this call to be shepherds doesn't work if we're just talking about the universal church. No, there has to be a local church, a committed covenant of people that I'm called to oversee. Consider this. Let, let's say we're at the park. There's a lot of little kids playing, all right? I'm a parent. I have six, six children. Let's say I see two kids over there screwing around, doing things that they shouldn't do. So I decide, I'm a parent. I go over, I spank the kids. <laughs> what would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. Front page of the news tomorrow, you would see Big black man spanks little white children. That's what you would see. But I'm a parent, and they're kids. No, no, no. But they're not your kids. You're called to parent your children. Not any children, your children. Same thing as a pastor. I don't pastor everyone. I pastor my flock. I pastor the people who God has entrusted to me. Does it mean that if someone off the street comes up and needs some biblical advice that I don't give it to them? No, of course you, you serve that person, you help them. But, but when you get into the weeds of things, my responsibility is to shepherd a specific group of people, and that can't be done apart from membership in a local church. Let's keep going. The third reason, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at verses 1 to 5. First Corinthians five, verses one to five. Don't spank other people's kids. <laughs> First Corinthians five, it says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the, same, in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved 
on the day of the Lord. The third biblical precedent for being part of a local church is church discipline. We don't talk much about that, but church discipline, write that down. So here, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he's addressing a serious issue. A case of incest has happened. So a guy is, is having an inappropriate relationship with his mother or maybe his stepmother, something along those lines. And so Paul instructs him or the church to hand the man over to Satan. In verse 13, he says, expel the immoral brother from among you. So he says, kick him out. Disfellowship him. Okay, kick him out. Kick him out of what? Kick him out of the universal church that has no physical reality? No, kick him out of the local church. This scripture doesn't work if there's not a covenant community, if there's not a physical, tangible, committed group of believers who assemble together. None of these scriptures work if you're just talking about the universal church. It's the local church. These, and there's even more, but these are three clear biblical precedents for people belonging to a local church. So why then should you join a local church? There's three reasons. Let's look at the first one. Let's go ahead and flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll work through verses 12 to 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27. Why should you and I join a local church? Okay, it says, just as a body, though many, excuse me, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its members, but all, let me start all over, I'm all over the place. (laughs) Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Is that right? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. Here's the first reason why you should be a part of the church. Write this down. You need the church. If you're a Christian, you need the church. Go back to verse 21. It said, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In other words, an individual member can't say to another individual member, I don't need you. How much more then can an individual member not say to the entire body that I don't need you? You can't do that. You need the church. Just as a hand needs the body, a Christian needs the church. Out on the street out here, there's people who walk up and down the street every day. So every day I see feet traveling up and down the street. I have never seen a foot travel down that street that was detached from a body. (laughs) I've never seen it. I've never seen a foot isolated from an entire body moving up and down that street. Is it possible? I suppose. <laughs> if, a, if a big gush of wind came and pushed the foot down, or if it was maybe on a severely inclined hill and it rolled down, but by and large, a foot can't move apart from the body. In order for that foot to function properly, it has to be a part of the entire body. It's the same thing with a Christian. Can you function properly as a Christian apart from involvement in a local church? Highly unlikely. In fact, I'll go ahead and say no. You were called, you were created to need the church. 
You should be a part of a local church because you need it. But in the same way, you need the church. This is the next one in your notes. The church also needs you. You need the church. The church needs you. Go back to verse 22. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. Indispensable. What does that mean? It means you need it. It means you can't just throw it away. You can't just dispense of it. It's indispensable. The church cannot function at its maximum capacity apart from your involvement in it. The church needs you. If you are not part of the church, the church is suffering. If you're not using your gift, the church is suffering. If you're not spiritually healthy, the church is suffering. The church needs you. And I'll give you a very practical example. We have children's ministry here. So each Sunday, the children's ministry oversees the children and, and pours into them so that many of you who have children are able to come in and be edified so that you can go back to your homes and raise your children well, right? So them serving edifies you really in a, in a direct fashion. We don't have enough people to do that, though. So each week, most of the people in children's ministry serve two, three, sometimes four times a month. Now, I do a early morning Bible study with them to make sure they still get the scriptures. I don't want them to be neglected, but by and, by and large, to a degree, they suffer when other people don't step up and help. If 15 people said, I'll help out once a month, even once every six weeks, now they can serve once or twice a month, and the whole church is built up. But when that doesn't happen, parts of the body suffer. Why? Because people aren't using their gift or they're not serving. Yes, you need the church, but the church needs you as well if it's going to be functioning at its maximum potential. And the third reason why you should join a church is found in John chapter 17. John 17, verse 20. Let's look at that. Write it down. John 17, verse 20. This is Jesus praying. And he says, my prayer is not for them alone. Talking about his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. This is us, future believers. So he prays for us that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you. May they also be in us. Why? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Very interesting. So as we're in one another unified, and Christ is in us, the world might believe that Jesus was sent. He's going to say it again. Keep reading. Verse 22. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Why? Why does God want us brought to complete unity? Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So as the church experiences this complete unity with one another, not this commitmentless faith, but this complete unity with one another, and then as Christ is unified with us, the world somehow comes to believe and acknowledge that Jesus was sent from God. Church membership, church unity, somehow has the ability to impact a lost world. But what's interesting is that when you strategize, you get in a room of people and you strategize, how can we reach the world? The knee-jerk reaction is going to be outreach ministries, outreach events, or attractive things on campus that draw people in. And when you bring people in through those methods, but then they come and see a divided church, what good is that? It probably does more harm than good. Or when you bring people in through those methods and they see a church of people who is not actually committed, what does it say about the faith? It's a negative thing. If people see commitmentless Christianity, what does that say about the faith? We say, God is amazing, have your sins forgiven, this is awesome, but I'm not willing to commit to a church. Like, what does that really show the world? When you are committed to a local church, you are showing that your faith is the real deal, that I am willing to voluntarily submit myself to this group of people who don't look like me, who don't necessarily act like me, but I'm voluntarily going to love these people and receive love from them, and I'm going to serve them, and they're going to serve me. It makes our faith credible. But when we're like, 
local church. I belong to the universal church. I'm going to bounce around from here to there. I think it reflects poorly on, 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 on our faith. When we commit to a church, it shows that our faith is a real deal. So, church family, it's time for us to define our relationship. What is this? You know I me mean? for six months. You're not going to get anything new at this point. And your relationship isn't with me. It's with us. We're going to have, in the next few weeks, some sort of information on what it looks like to be a member of the Village Church. We might have some dinners. We might have some classes. I don't, we haven't figured that out yet. But I, I do feel heavily like it's time for us to define what this is. Why? Because I need to know who I should be praying for. I need to know every week who should be on my list to be praying for, to be reaching out to, to be holding accountable. Like, I'm responsible for the shepherding of a group of people. I got to know who those people are. And so that's where we're going. We will be discussing that in the next few weeks. But I would encourage you, even if you're not ready to commit to the village, fine. You need to be somewhere, though. You need to be somewhere. If you're a Christian, you need to be in covenantal community somewhere where you're giving and serving and receiving love, receiving accountability, confessing sin to one another. Like, that is what is going to facilitate your spiritual growth. If you're trying to do this Christian life on your own, trust me, you're not operating the way God desires you to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. So your homework is to go home, pray about where you want to be a, a, a member of, and I'll give you some more information in the next couple of weeks on what it looks like to be a member here. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Oh God, thank you for just the church. Would you please correct any false assumptions of what the church is in this room? Help us to see clearly what the church was meant to be. And help us to live in that. And I also pray for anyone who's not a part of the church, who's not even in the family of believers. Would you please, in this moment, make it crystal clear of what it means to be a part of the family of God? None of us in this room is good enough to dwell with a holy God on our own. None of us. I'm just going to say it. You're not good enough, but Jesus is. Jesus paid for the sin that we could not pay for. This faith is for humble people. This faith is for people who recognize their sin and recognize their need for forgiveness. God, please make that crystal clear to us today. And if there's anyone who is not a part of this family, quicken their hearts and awaken them to that and reveal to them that you love them and you desire to forgive their sin. It's already been paid for, and their proper response is to offer their life as a living sacrifice. God, make that clear to us. Thank you for your spirit and that the Holy Spirit has formed this eternal spiritual family. Please help us to appreciate it and live it out well. All God's people said together, amen. amen.